Good afternoon. This is Robin Kirby Gatto. Welcome to this afternoon's teaching, Song of Solomon. Oh my goodness. I pray that you all are enjoying this journey. We are on session 31, and we will be looking at verses 4 and 5 today in greater detail. Let me just double check those verses. Verses 5 and 6. We will be looking at verses 5 and 6 in greater detail. So as you join on, be super hopeful and expectant. God is going to encourage and strengthen you. And He's just going to pour in truth and bring that abundant life and give refreshing in Jesus' name. Amen. And so I'm going to go ahead and enter into this broadcast with prayer. God, we just bless your name, Father. We thank you, God, for the strength of truth that stirs us mightily in our inner man. And that, God, as we listen to your word, you will root us deeply, ground us securely in the love of Christ, that we will have knowledge, wisdom, and understanding as Holy Spirit shows us things that are fenced in and hidden, combining scriptures and interpreting to us the holy teachings of the revealing of Christ Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Barbara, hey, Cheris. Hey, Sherry, God bless y'all. Thank you for joining in. And I'm going to go ahead and get started. I had to put new batteries in this. And I also just had my door painted. That is so amazing. And I love painted and the word painted. Because when you understand the Hebrew word for anointing, it means smeared and painted We've been here now almost six years, and they've totally redone the hallways, and it is beautiful. And one of my favorite colors is orange, and they have orange in the hallways as an accent color. And they just got through painting my door, and I had to leave it open. So for the sake of all of those in this stairwell, I started later. Otherwise, they would hear me all the way down that stairwell. Hey, Kimberly, God bless you. And so we are in Song of Solomon 5 and 6. Oh, my goodness. Last teaching, session 30, was beyond amazing on Song of Solomon 4 4. It was powerful about the arsenal of prayer. So today we're looking at that righteousness of Christ Jesus made known in the Shulamite in prayer and the warfare you can expect to experience. I know a lot of people are afraid to pray certain things because you enter into warfare at different times, occasions in your life. But remember, it is only to cause you to look up to where your help comes from and to cry out to God for that help so that he takes you from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18, with an unveiled face as you behold the glory of God is in a mirror with an unveiled face and you're transformed into that likeness from one degree of splendor to another as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. And so we're going to look at verses 5 and 6 today in Song of Solomon. And I'm going to unpack that process of how you enter into warfare at times and how to enter it successfully and how not to invite unnecessary warfare and how to perceive a root of iniquity operating against your members that's bringing unnecessary warfare. So that's three things that we're really going to look at. And unnecessary warfare, because you've stepped out of God's will, as well as unnecessary warfare because of the root of iniquity that might be operative because of relationships that might have an open door to that to attack your person. So, oh my goodness, today is going to be so amazing. Let's begin it's Song of Solomon 4, and let's, let me get my other glasses because these need massive cleaning. Let me get my other glasses. Mm 
Yay! So I've got my other glasses, and it actually matches my outfit. So these are a lot better. And we're going to look at verse 5 and then verse 6. And oh my, all I can say is, you are going to be so glad you watch this broadcast. So Song of Solomon 4 verse 5. Scripture says, and we're seeing the good shepherd depict the Shulamite. Again, it is an agricultural scene set outside. And so you see the Shulamite and you see all these agricultural uh, settings around her, animals, landscape, rocky mountains, and all of these are to be a metaphor for the Shulamite, which represents the Christian. So let's look at verse 5. Your two breasts are like two fawns, like twins of a gazelle that feed among the lilies. Let's read verse 6, and then we'll come back to this. Until, now this is her, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away in my thoughts, I will get to the mountain of myrrh and frankincense and the hill of frankincense to join who, him whom my soul desires. So these two verses, we're going to be looking at the intensity of spiritual warfare that you endure at times, but also your approach in overcoming. Amen? So again, the two verses, Song of Solomon 4, verses 5 and 6. Your two breasts are like two fawns, like twins of a gazelle that feed among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away in my thoughts, I will get to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense to him to whom my soul desires, adores. Yes, it is, Lisa. So let me, when I bend down like this, I'm always taking my shoes off and crossing my leg and sitting on my hip because I'm really getting into it. You can tell when I get into those teachings because I get closer and I lead in, but oh my goodness, all I can tell you is buckle up. This is going to be one of the most profound teachings. You're going to want to hit the save button. If you're not on my YouTube list, hit on Robin Kirby Gatto, subscribe YouTube, and get this session 31 today on your saved list. So verse 5, we see the metaphor of two breasts. Breasts represent righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, as in Ephesians 6, the breastplate of righteousness. So the breast is actually a breastplate, and it represents not her righteousness, but his righteousness. And then we see the comparison that they're like fawns that feed among the lilies. And so this represents spiritual growth. Remember chapter 1? We looked at coming into salvation and being a bondservant. Chapter 2, being under the banner of God's love and growing strong in spirit. And then chapter 3, we saw the maturity of being led by the Spirit. So now chapter 4, it is about prayer. And so, guess what it's about? More spiritual growth. Amen. You know, a lot of people don't want spiritual growth if it comes with warfare. But, oh my goodness, when you're in the will of the Father, you're doing what the Father tells you to do, that warfare is necessary because a couple of things... You've entered at the effectual door where there are many adversaries, as Paul the Apostle describes. Let me get that scripture. <clears throat> that is 1 Corinthians 16, 9, and also in Acts 14, 22, through many trials and tribulations, we enter the kingdom of heaven. And so, let me just give you a news flash. 
there is going to be warfare. But greater is Christ Jesus. Let me get that. Greater is Christ in you, 1 John 4, 4, than he that is in the world. It isn't interesting. It's 1 John 4, 4. Greater is Christ in you than he that is in this world. And so what is all this warfare about? It's about your faith, 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. Be exceedingly glad, rejoice when you experience what? Fiery trials, tribulations, in other words, warfare. That the testing of your faith, which is more precious than gold, will redound to your praise, glory, and honor when Christ Jesus is revealed. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. And so that's what's happening with a Shulamite is the good shepherd, the king, is being revealed in her, in his righteousness, by her warfare. And part of that process is pruning. For those of y'all who have got my book from last year, Mindfulness, the Mind of Christ, you really see the amplification of deliverance, consecration of the body, the mind and the body connection, and deliverance. And it is potent. If you don't have that book, I highly encourage you get that book, Mindfulness, the Mind of Christ on Amazon. But when we look at looking like Christ more and more, it's that warfare that pushes us into that position. How? Because the Word is tried. The Word is persecuted. So let me give you scriptures on this. How do, there's going to be a couple I'm going to give you. There's one in Psalm, Psalm 12, 6, where the Word is tried seven times. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried by the fire, purged from the earth, refined seven times. And let's also go to Psalm 105. Psalm 105. And we're going to go to verses 16. 16. Let me go to verse 16. This is the prophecy about Joseph. And I want you to see how the word is tried in Joseph. And it's persecuted. So Psalm 105, 16. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land of Egypt. He cut off every source of bread. Who is he? God. God called the famine. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold as a servant. His feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in chains of iron. And his soul entered the iron, verse 19, until his word to his cruel brothers came true, until the word of the Lord had tried and tested him. And you're saying, wait a minute, Robin, this is Old Testament. No, it's New Testament. Let's go to Mark 4, 17. The sower of seed, the seed is the word. That word is sown in the soil. The soil is the soul. It is us. Let's go to Mark 4, 17. Scripture says, uh, verse 17 and they have no real root in themselves. He's talking about the stony ground. They have no real root in themselves. And so they endure for a little while. Then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, they are immediately offended, become displeased, indignant, resentful, and they stumble and fall away. And so we see that the Word of God is persecuted. It is tried. And so that is your trials and tribulations. When you go into being a Christian, I love how the Lord is so good at acclimating you to the capacity that you're able to handle. And then all of a sudden, after a while, it just seems like 
warfare comes. Some people have it right out of the gate. Other people just go through what I would analogize as a honeymoon phase and everything is great. And then all of a sudden they wake up and war warfare starts and they're out of that honeymoon phase, so to speak. And they're wondering what in the world is going on. Oh my goodness. Those of y'all who know me, I have people that in the past have not wanted to read my books because they said, Robin, I know if I read it, there's going to be warfare. And I tell them, look, how much spiritual growth do you want? Do you want to know the word? Do you want it sown in your person? Well, if it is sown, it is going to be tried and it is going to be persecuted. And so think of the ground and the seed that is planted. And we want it to be like verse 20. And those sown on good, well-adapted soil are the ones that hear the word, receive it, accept it, welcome it. No matter the persecution, they welcome it and they bear fruit some 30 times as much, some 60 times as much, some 100 times as much. And so they're pers they go through the persecution as well. They receive the word and they just know God is going to get me through. He's going to do this for my benefit. He is working all what the enemy meant for my harm. Romans 8, 28. God is working to my good, to my benefit because I love him and I'm called according to his purpose. Amen. And so let's look at scripture here and let's understand what is going on as we look at the metaphors of the gazelle, as we look at the metaphors of the fawns feeding among the lilies. And so the fawns represent spiritual maturity and the lilies represent the spirit. So let's look at these Hebrew words and unpack these Hebrew letters and see the word picture of what is happening right here. And so the actual word used in the King James Version is rose. And this is the Hebrew word sabiyah. Sabiyah, and it means a female gazelle, a roe. The feminine part is the Hebrew word sabi, and it means beauty, glory, honor, glorious, goodly, pleasant. And it means splendor. And so this gazelle, this roe, this fawn, as it is in the Amplified Classic, is a foreshadowing of 2 Corinthians 3.18 that we with an unveiled face as we behold the glory of God we are being transformed into that image from one degree of splendor to another as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. And so this word, the root word for fawns, for roe, for gazelle is sabi and it means prominence splendor, conspicuous, beautiful, glorious, goodly, pleasant. It also means row. So let's look at the Hebrew letters of this full word for row, which is sabiya, and it is said, bet, and hay. Said, bet, and hay and let's look at this word picture for Hebrew of what is actually going on in this metaphor here. So, say, T-S-A-D-E, is the ancient symbol of fish hook, and it means catch, desire, need. Bet is the ancient symbol of a tent, and it means tent, house, household, family. And hay is a stick man raising his arms at worshiping, and it means to reveal, but the stick man is also beholding. And that is the emphasis for the word picture right here. As we look at these three Hebrew letters, they form the word picture caught in the house, which is revealed where you are beholding. Who are you beholding? The glory of God. Where? In Christ in the Good Shepherd. In this process, you're being circumcised in the heart. Hebrews 4.12 
and that is part of the warfare. It is cutting to your intentions, dividing between soul and spirit, between intent and motive. That is what the warfare is all about. And so when the seed is planted in the soil, it needs just the right pressure. Ding, 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 ding. And just the right pressure will pop that thing open and cause it to begin to sprout. If it's too much pressure, it will crush the kernel. It will crush the seed. If it's not enough pressure, that thing won't pop up just the right amount and allow the growth of that tree, that plant that is in there. So the lilies of the field represent just the right amount of pressure of trying as you're in the righteousness of Christ Jesus to overcome those trials, those tribulations, and that is First Peter 1, 6, and 7. Be exceedingly glad, rejoice, when fiery trials and tribulations and suffering of temptations at the testing of your faith, which is more precious than gold, will redound to your praise, to your glory, to your honor, when Christ Jesus is revealed. So the whole purpose is to reveal Christ. Oh my goodness. There are so many times that my sons have experienced warfare and I thought it was for them. But no, I found out that as my sons went through warfare, that those particular battles they went through also were areas in which only those particular battles could get to places in my heart that needed the word to manifest. Let me give you an example. In 2002, when I got delivered on Resurrection Sunday from alcoholism, prior to that, I had been eating teachings for years on the fear of the Lord. I continued to eat teachings for years on the fear of the Lord and I got in a ditch of just the fear of the Lord and I didn't have it balanced out with love and so resurrection power which is our inheritance revealed in Ephesians 1 17 through 23 that resurrection power is one coin that has two sides and it is the fear of the Lord and the love of God and those two places, the fear of the Lord and the love of God, they keep us in the narrow way. If we have the love of God and we don't have the fear of the Lord, then we'll get into a ditch and we'll get out of balance. The same thing in being in the fear of the Lord and not having the love of God, we'll get in a ditch and we'll be out of balance. So we have different battles in our life that address that issue. So my oldest son in 2005 started experiencing warfare in a greater measure and it lasted and it continued and it was about 2007 that this battle was still going on and I was just in a ditch and I was before this time when I would preach in Sunday school, I'm telling you guys, it was so bad. You think, okay, yeah, Robin, how bad could it be? Well, when I would teach in Sunday school, that after I taught, we were by a hospital probably about uh, a quarter of a mile down the road, three red lights away. And so after I taught Sunday school, I literally scared this man to death that he left Sunday school and went to the emergency room and thought he was having a heart attack. I kid you not. I was like the fear of the Lord and everybody was going to hell. And I truly thought for a time in the church, I thought that most of the people there were going to hell and that only my family was going, and a few others were not going to go to hell. I mean, 
Y'all, I kid you not. I was massively extreme and I didn't have that balance of love. And so in 2007, after my son had been in this trial for a couple of years, and I'm thinking, this is his trial and he just needs to get on with the ball game. God dealt with me, I tell you. And he had me enter a time of just seeking him as never before. And this is when I was on the red carpet reading John 1, 1 through 18 over and over and over. And a few things happened, not just what happened with my son reaching to me, but other things happened. How many of you know that God's multifaceted? But I'll never forget God reaching my heart. And actually, it was pro yeah, it was about 2007, 2006, 2007. And God told me, he said, Robin, you are going to push your son away from me because you have got such an imbalance and you need the love of God. And he just broke my heart and I repented and he just went to that place that only that trial could get to that place in my soul and I thank God for it. And you have to understand that some of your trials and your spiritual warfare, it might seem painful. It might seem unpleasant. You might wish you wouldn't have to go through it. But I'm telling you that it is the trying and the testing of the Word of God to circumcise your heart and to go to your intentions and to go to your motives so that you have that splendor of Christ in you. Oh my goodness, that is worth it all. And so we see in these three Hebrew letters for this word for row or fawns or gazelles, we see being caught in the house that is revealed, which you are beholding. And so you're beholding God. You're beholding Christ. Christ, John 1.18, came to interpret and show us the Father. And if we've seen Jesus, if we understand the Word, then we've seen the Father, not with the eyes on our face, but with the eyes of our heart. Ephesians 1, 18, as they are flooded with light, and light is a metaphor for truth. So let's look at this next word as we look at the fawns that are in verse 5. And that they are twins. This is not just happenstance. And so it represents here, it represents as it comes from the Hebrew word ta'am. And it represents double joined and twined. And so this word twins here in the Hebrew actually represents that we're twined, we're joined to God. Very similar to how the word Levi means joined to. And that's why we have to seek our hearts to stay in a place of humility. Because isn't it interesting that the word Leviathan, which represents pride, it has that Levi in there where the enemy seeks to join to those in Christ. Just like with Lucifer in heaven who exalted himself against God the enemy tries to, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 8, exalt his word against Jesus. And we have to take our thoughts captive and we have to bring it under submission in Christ Jesus, under the word, amen. And so this word twins represents that we're twined, we're joined to Christ and we're choosing to rise up in that maturity, which is represented by the lilies. Isn't that interesting because the gazelles are feeding among the lilies. So let's look, it should be Shushan or something like that. Let's look at this word. For lilies, it is the Hebrew word Shushan. And it means, and it's actually where the name Susan comes from. And it means whiteness. It's a flower for its whiteness. And it's ar architectural ornament as a trumpet. And so there's two things that are going on. Whiteness, which means atonement. And it's funny because that trumpet, and we're getting ready for the Feast of Trumpets next week. And so that trumpet represents 
the word sounding and resounding the boldness of what this means which is Christ in us the hope of glory the righteous are as bold as a lion let me get this scripture the righteous are as bold as a lion and that is Proverbs 28 1 the wicked flee when no one pursues but the righteous are as bold as a lion so when you do anything and everything where whatever you do you're doing it in the righteousness of Christ the enemy is not intimidated by a title the enemy is intimidated by one thing alone in the saint and that is the righteousness of Christ that is to always be our first aim that is to be our major that we are in the righteousness of Christ Matthew 6 33 seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things shall be added unto you amen so let's go back and let's look at the Hebrew letters which is amazing it is sheen noon sheen noon so it is basically double there's your double again you're gonna see that in this particular verse that double is emphasized and when it's double it's being replicated it's being like DNA it's being duplicated and so Christ is being duplicated in us reproduced that is first Peter 1 6 and 7 that we're going to be celebrating we're in a trial we're celebrating why because Christ is going to be seen in us not us just like in the book in which I'm contributing and I'm sharing about Matthew's 13 year journey through a crushed spirit and being a mother and helping navigate a child with a crushed spirit and so some of the things that you have to deal with with a crushed spirit is a lot of suicidal issues and a lot of suicidal attempts and attempts to hurt the self the person as I've worked with people with a crushed spirit that is one of the biggest tendencies that of symptoms of someone with a crushed spirit is that they're very suicidal and as I walked through that 13 year journey that ended this January January 2022 thank you Lord I was in that trial for 13 years and the whole purpose of that trial was reproduce Christ in me the hope of glory and it was this year about January Matthew was on the couch the switch had flipped God had done a massive healing and freedom upon his person and he and I were sitting here on this couch and he was holding my hand and he looked at me in the eyes and he said mom when I look at you I see Jesus and y'all that just I held it together and I didn't just lose it when he said that to me but oh my goodness after he was out of my presence I was just undone and you know that's the purpose is to see Christ in you where we decrease John 3 and Christ in us increases that is the whole purpose as we go through spiritual growth which is in spiritual warfare so now let's look at sheen and noon sheen and noon it is that exclamation point sheen noon even though we see two sheen and noon it's a pattern when you see a pattern in Hebrew it is an exclamation when you see it double like the punctuation in Hebrew is here the pattern the double 
And that's the exclamation. So we see Sheen and Noon twice. Sheen is the ancient Hebrew letter that's jagged teeth. It looks like a jagged W. And it means to consume in the positive. And Noon is a fish swimming through water. And it means life and activity. So the word picture for Lily is consumed with life. And with the activity of life, exclamation, that eternal life that is in the saint is just being seasoned and increasing in maturity with the warfare. There's so many times, even seasoned saints, just in general, we forget to return to the, our first love to really know Christ and we can get so much information and think that we're advancing in our Christian walk and before we know it we feel like we've almost gone 10 steps backwards and it's because we have to keep the main thing the main thing which is the joy of our salvation which is all about Christ so it is about his life eternal life that we've been given it's this eternal life. It is the essence of God in our temple. That's what life is. People think eternal life means over there on the other side of glory. No. Eternal life is the essence of God just deposited in you, the Zoe. And now you're a carrier of the Zoe, which is the Greek word for life. Strong's Concordance 22.22. So you're the carrier of the Zoe. And that's what you're deposited with. And it's not for the other side of glory. You'll get it over there. No. You've got it now. He gave it to you now. He distributed it by coming into the knowledge of who he was when he was in the body. And by the knowledge of that... He distributed that justification that would be made known to the sons and daughters of God. And that is the eternal Zoe. That's what you carry. And so it's almost like the exterior of your person is that seed, shell of the seed. And the internal part is the Zoe. The eternal life. And so the more spiritual warfare you go through, it's just stripping that shell off that has been you to some capacity, but you're decreasing. And so the Zoe is being seen. And Christ Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. He is all of that, John 14, 6. And so when people see the Zoe, the eternal life in you, they don't see you. They see Jesus. But that's how they see him, through that eternal life that you're shining brightly. As you're a light shining that eternal life. John 1, 4 in him was life, and that life was the light of men. That Zoe was the light. It is the light of men. It is the light of Christ, so that when people see the Zoe, when they see the essence of God in your person, they're seeing Christ. They're seeing His glory. Woo! That word in Greek is dokio, and it means glory. It also indicates copiousness, and it also means opinion, and it comes from the root word doxi, do, uh, doxa, which means uh, thoughts and opinions. So you have to look at glory as the thoughts and opinions of God. That those thoughts and opinions are just 
beyond phenomenal. There's no way to describe them. That those thoughts and opinion of God are who God is. And God reveals those thoughts and opinions to us. Is that not phenomenal? And so now let's look at one other word. And then we'll, and we'll kind of get into a little bit, get a little morsel of what to expect in the next broadcast. But I'm not going to get into all of it. So let me get into the beginnings of verse 6. Verse 5, we see she is in the righteousness of Christ. She's growing strong in spirit. She is maturing as the growth of the eternal life that she's been deposited with. As it begins to be seen and it's compared to a field of lilies or lilies. And so when you see lilies here, it represents the atonement of Christ Jesus, His righteousness and it means that blossoming of spiritual growth. And that is life. It indicates the life, the Zoe, the eternal life that's manifesting in our souls. Amen. So verse 6. Now we start seeing a little bit on the horizon. Oh my goodness. Here comes some warfare. Oh no. Help me Jesus. No, after today and the next day's broadcast, Session 32, which I'll do on Thursday, you'll be saying, praise God, my eyes are above on where my help comes from, and I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing, greater is Christ Jesus in me than he that is in this world, and you're going to welcome those God-appointed appointments of warfare, amen? So verse 6 says, until, and this is the Shulamite speaking, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away in my thoughts, I will get to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense to him to whom my soul adores. Now listen to this one more time, and we're just going to inch in an intro into spiritual warfare because this is kind of like, oh my goodness. Things have changed. I've been in this honeymoon phase and things are feeling good. But oh my goodness, there's enough maturity. There's enough spiritual maturity just like there was in Song of Solomon 2. When there was maturity and she was starting to get spiritual growth. And so the war warfare came. Amen, Amy. And now here, there's more matur maturity and spiritual growth. And so what? The word is persecuted. The word is tried. You are just a vessel carrying the word. You carry the Zoe and you carry the word. And so it is going to be tried and tested in you so that the shell comes off and the Zoe, that life, Christ is seen, that light. Amen. Verse 6 again. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away in my thoughts, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hills of frankincense to him whom my soul adores. So we see a couple of things here. I'm not going to unpack it all right now, but it's just to give you a little morsel. And so there's shadows, and it represents that in the trials, in the tribulations, in the spiritual warfare, that comes with the word and as you're faithful God is going to give you heaven's prayers to pray in spiritual warfare what I have seen what God has shown me in my own life and that of others is that when we get into spiritual warfare we are so emotionally tied to it and take it personally in a wrong perspective and seeing heaven's pers instead of seeing heaven's perspective and as a result we pray soulish spiritual warfare prayers which are really prayers of iniquity and that all it does is it causes the warfare to go longer and you're staying in that position of a longer trial when instead, God is allowing you to 
be circumcised on a deeper level so that you get out of those soulish prayers and you see heaven's perspective. And as soon as you pray heaven's prayers, heaven's perspective, God answers those prayers. Amen. It might take some time, but as long as you're praying heaven's prayers, that is going to be heard and answered. And I go into massive detail about that in the new book, The Forbidden Fruit, The Spiritual Disease, about praying heaven's prayers and how to not pray soulish prayers. So let's look at this. And let's get just to a couple of metaphors here. I'm not going to break it down. I'm just getting to two metaphors. So we see the day breaking and the shadows flee away. So the day breaking represents that life, that Zoe eternal life, that life of Christ that is now rising up in our members and is shining forth. And that that is going to send the shadows fleeing. What is that? Isaiah 59, 10, which we'll go into more detail. Where the enemy comes in like a flood. And at that time, God raises his standard against him. And that's the light that's rising up. And that's sending the enemy fleeing in seven directions. And then we see about going to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of of frankincense to see him who my soul ado adores. So I'm just going to touch into it on it briefly here and bring this in as it relates to trials and tribulations. And so the myrrh actually in Hebrew means bitter and that frankincense is that sweet, fiery, anointing smell and that represents the anointing. That in the times where that bitterness comes against our soul, it's not to our detriment, rather it's to our benefit. How do you handle something? How do you handle the bitter trial? Do you handle it in the fruits of Holy Spirit? Do you handle it with truth? Or do you allow the bitterness to take a hold of your soul and to pull you in and to make you angry and bitter at other people where you begin to pray soulish prayers and you're coming against people although you say no it's the enemy in them but it is absolutely easy to see the fruit when you can tell the works the ergon coming from the soul that is praying coming from the soul that is wrestling with an issue. And so when we get to the next broadcast, I'm going to go deeper into verse 6, and we're going to unpack it. I'm going to get into Isaiah 40, and I'm going to get into other areas in which we have to guard against praying soulish prayers, and we have to pray the prayers of heaven and how to shut the door to the root of iniquity that might be bringing unnecessary warfare. And how to shut the door to soulish prayers and to only pray the will of the Father. Is that not phenomenal? Love you, Sue. God bless you all. Thank you for joining in. You all are so precious. And I thank God for each and every one of you. God bless you. I love you. And I'll see you next thir this Thursday.